<laughs> I'm kind of excited to preach this sermon, not because it's uh, necessarily a better topic than other topics, but because I've been talking about it with Michael for some time. But I haven't told him what it was. I just told him a bombshell sermon is coming up. <coughs> just because, um, yeah, it's something that we've talked about quite a bit in the past, but he doesn't know what I'm going to preach on this morning. But just um, the heads up as well, t- I think today's sermon is going to be a long one. So just brace yourselves. Um, and if you need to get up and use the bathroom or grab a drink or whatever you need to walk about, that's fine. But I didn't want to, I didn't want to stretch it over two sermons, so I'm going to try to preach it all. Let's go, go to Matthew 19. <clears throat> and it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, and tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is, uh, which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is, good, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, if you haven't sort of caught on already, what I'm going to preach on this morning, because I've already preached on marriage, I'm going to preach on, I guess, the the dark um, cousin of marriage, which is the bill of divorcement. Now, it's, it's an interesting topic because I think it, it's something that, um, you know, obviously is applicable to today because unfortunately a lot of people are breaking their wedding vows um, and getting divorced um, in the wrong way. But um, we see here in Matthew 19 that there is actually a justification for divorce. A lot of people um, believe that there is, no, like, there are some people that take the position that there is no justification for divorce. They'll say like, no, 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 till death to us part, you know, th- there is absolutely no reason why you should ever be able to get a divorce. But we see here in Matthew 19 that there is actually a justification for divorce and, and Jesus actually spells it out himself. And you can read this passage, it's not said exactly the same way, but you can also read it in Matthew 5, in Mark 10 and in Luke uh, 16. Uh, but it says here, let me just go back to that verse. Uh, da, da, da. No, whoops, too far. Oh, where is it? Uh, oh, here. In verse 9, he says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So there is a justification for divorce. And it's clearly said by Jesus Christ that it's fornication. Now, this is what we're going to talk about today is what is that fornication um, and, and how does this apply? Because this is where people disagree. Because everybody agrees, because it's clear in this verse, that there is a justification for divorce. What we disagree on is what that phrase, except it be for fornication, actually means. And that's what I want to go through today. Now, um, there's a couple of things I want to show you today. One, number one is I want to just explain what my position um, on this topic is. And as we go through the sermon, it will become evident what my, top, what my position is. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to, to sort of um, you to pay attention to as I preach this sermon is also the way in which I uh, build a doctrine and also test a doctrine. Do you know what I mean? Because I believe, you know, it's easy to, to get a passage like this and run with it. And if this is all you're considering... Just say, you know, it's fornication and define fornication as sex outside of marriage and that's the only justification for divorce and therefore adultery is not a justification for divorce. Now if that's the position, uh, if we come up with a doctrinal position, we now have to test that position, right? It needs to be sound speech, sound doctrine and the way we test it is with that interpretation, can we explain every other verse in the Bible that touches on this topic? And I personally don't believe we can, and that's why my position is adultery is justification for divorce. Now, there are three, basically, um, 
There are three basic positions that you can have in terms of this exception. Number one is the fornication happens before the couple is even betrothed, right? So the fornication happens before the couple is betrothed and then they get betrothed and then, or they get married and then the husband or the wife discover the fornication, right? So that's one, that's one um, example, uh, one, one situation. The second situation is that they were both pure when they got married, but then before they consummated the marriage, there was some fornication, right? So before, before the consummation. So you've got um, uh, bef- well, while they were single, and then you've got while they were betrothed, but before they actually married and consummated the marriage. And then, which is my position, um, is if the fornication is even after consummation, this one still applies. So those are the three positions, and those are the three that we're sort of going to um, look into today. Now let's actually go to the law um, where uh, Jesus is actually quoting from because Jesus is not just uh, you know, talking about the bill of divorcement because it, it's just something that's in the New Testament. It's actually a law from the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 24. And we'll read that here. In Deuteronomy 24 it says, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favour in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it, in her, give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So if you consider the three different positions, there are, if you were to take the first position where you say fornication is only outside of marriage, it's not when people are either betrothed or uh, have consummated the marriage. So that's what fornication is, and they'll take that definition and they'll say, well, if we interpret this passage, it's the fornication happened before they were married, then he got married to the wife and then he found this uncleanness and then that was the justification for divorce and then they'll say you see Jesus said it was because of the hardness of your heart and even though God never wanted people to divorce he allowed this because people were so stubborn that they wanted this divorce that is um, one way that you can interpret this passage if you take the position that it's sing- that um, the fornication happened when they were single now it's similar, the interpretation would be similar if you said the fornication happened between, uh, uh, between, uh, before the consummation of the marriage. So between betrothal and the consummation, you'd say the same. You would say, well, they got married and then it came to pass that she found her favour in his eyes because he found some uncleanness, but the uncleanness happened at the, um, at the betrothal period. And I'll explain why they take that um, position in a second. And then therefore, that's the justification for divorce. But once you've consummated the marriage, that's it. You're married for life. Now, with those two positions, what you would have to do with this scripture, you would have to believe that when it says, when a man had taken a wife and married her, you would have to believe that that married her, uh, is, it contains the definition of uh, betrothal. Right? Because if, you, if you're going to accept that... Um, uh, for the second position, because the first position, right, saying the fornication happened outside of it. If it's saying, if you're taking the second position, then you would have to, you would have to um, accept that when it says, and married her, that betrothal can be called married. Does that make sense? Because if it says a man had taken a wife and married her, and then it comes to pass that he find uncleanness in her, that means if you're taking the fornication as after betrothal, then you would have to uh, admit that betrothal can also be referred to as married and then you can have that passage as as consistent with your position now let's go on um, and i'll come back to my i'll explain my position at the end but i'll just go through um, the other positions now deuteronomy 22 is an interesting passage we go down to uh, verse 13 now, one of the reasons why I think this sermon is going to be interesting, because I'm going to be going to a lot of passages that you probably never heard preached on before, but are pertinent to, to this topic. All right, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 22 says here, If a man take a wife and go in unto her, and hate her, and give occasions of speech against her, and bring up an evil name upon her. So I think, I believe that hate her is saying that he goes in unto her, and then he 
he puts her away because you know Jesus uses that in another um, a passage where he says he hates it. if you hate your wife um, you're putting her away and give occasions of speech against her bring up an evil name upon her and say I took this woman and when I came to her I found her not a maid now, I just want you to notice the words that are getting used here. He says, I took this woman, right? And what does he mean by that? It's when he, when he, when he came in under her, right? Because this is the point at which he's realizing she's not a maid. I took this woman, and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And, and a lot of people believe that this cloth is, you know, when, when a woman is a virgin and then when they, the, the couple sleeps together, you know, when, when the, the virginity inside her breaks, she bleeds. And this cloth is proof that she was a virgin the night they got, um, they slept together. That's what a lot of people believe this cloth is. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him, and they shall nurse him in a hundred shekels of silver, so that's double the portion of um, a dowry, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. But if this thing be true, and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, then shall they bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die. Because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. So this is an interesting passage. And you know, sometimes when we see stonings in the Bible, when we see people put to death, um, you know, I, I think we get the wrong image because we, 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 we imagine like this poor girl that didn't know what she was doing um, and she's getting stoned to death. But, you know, fornication and adultery is a really serious thing. And this is what God is trying to, to, to emphasize in his word when he, when he stones adulterers. He stones people that are palming off themselves as virgins, but they are not. Um, you know, he stones homosexuals. He stones people that are murderers because he's trying to make a point that it's a very serious sin. Um, and we shouldn't look at laws in the Bible where God has mandated the death sentence and think, oh, God is being too harsh. No, no, we're being too soft because we are getting soft on things that God hates and God has put in a punishment in place to, to, to reveal to us how he feels about it. So we have the wrong point of view if we think God is being harsh when he sets a law um, where somebody is put to death. But anyway, what's going on here? See, I believe that uh, this is somebody that has um, uh, sort of pretended to be pure and then married somebody and then the, the person has found out that um, she is not pure. Now, if you take the position that the fornication happened before the betrothal, right? So when these people were single, then you have to ask the question, what makes Deuteronomy 24 different to this passage, right? Because Deuteronomy 24, if you believe that the fornication happened before betrothal, you have a lady that has already committed fornication. She's unclean. He finds the uncleanness, but in that scenario, he just puts her away. Now, why in this scenario where it's the same, where the fornication has happened before, right? She's played the whore in her father's house. He's now discovered that she's not a maid. But in this scenario, she's put to death, right? So you kind of think like, well, what's the difference between those two scenarios? Is there a difference? Well, if you take the position that the fornication happens before betrothal, one way you can say, well, the difference between these is one is um, she didn't admit, she didn't confess her guilt. Right? So he's found out, maybe, maybe she, she's committed, being the whore in her father's house, but she's married and then she's come clean and said, you know what, I, I, I said I was a virgin, but I'm not. And maybe if she co confesses her guilt, he can't bring her, right? Because then he hasn't like, discovered it of his own accord. Or you could say the difference is that this passage actually makes it a point and says in verse 13, if any man take a wife and go in unto her, so you can make the distinction between Deuteronomy 24 and Deuteronomy 22 and say, well, in this passage, it's because th the marriage has actually been consummated. And at that point, if she's committed fornication and she's found out, now she's stoned to death because now it's too, it's too late if you've consummated the marriage. So that's where people get the position from in Deuteronomy 24. Remember, there were, I said there were three positions. You get the fornication before that they were betrothed. 
This is how people, I believe, come to the position where the fornication, uh, the bill of divorce only applies, and I wish I had some visuals because I'm, I'm, I'm getting sort of mixed up I'm trying to describe this to you. I hope you guys are following. So if the fornication happened before, um, you, are, you can be put away. Um, that's the first position, and, and the difference between this position is that it's been consummated. The second position, which says you can put her away up until the point of betrothal, they say that because if the marriage has been consummated, the woman is stoned to death, right? So therefore, it, it's redundant for you to be able to put her away if um, it's up to that betrothal period. So you can still have those two positions consistent and explain these, these two passages. Now, if we continue on, because I just want to show you this here. Uh, if we continue on in Deuteronomy 22, we actually see the punishments for fornication and for adultery and for um, uh, committing fornication during the betrothal period. It says here in Deuteronomy 22:22, 22, 22, if a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto her husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. Now it's interesting to note here that the punishment for sleeping with a betrothed woman is the same punishment as sleeping with a woman that is married. But what I want to point out here is, it's not just that, because we see that the, the seriousness of the crime is the same, because God ascribed the same punishment. But what I want to point out here is, if the punishment is the same, why does God make a distinction between a married woman and a betrothed woman? Because remember, if you want to accept that the fornication happened before um, betrothal or before marriage, but then Deuteronomy 24 says, if a man takes a wife and marries her, then if marriage, if betrothal can be referred to as marriage, why does God need to give two laws to say a woman that is married and a woman that is betrothed if a woman that is betrothed is married? Does that make sense? So there's two laws here because I believe there's, there's a distinction made between a, a woman that is betrothed because they haven't consummated and a woman that is married because a married woman is a woman that has betrothed a man and consummated the marriage. And that's the different difference. But God is saying here that the law and the punishment is the same whether you're betrothed or whether you're married. It's, it's death by stoning. Um, now, verse 25. If a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, so this is rape here, and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. So it's saying if a man's murdered, he didn't do anything wrong. It's obviously the murderer that did something wrong. And saying here, if a man rapes the woman, you put the rapist to death. You don't um, do anything to the damsel because she cried and nobody could help her. For he found her in the field and the, damsel, the, and the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He shall not put her away all his days. Um, the reason why I just wanted to touch on this verse is because, you know, a lot of people will say that the Bible teaches that a man rapes a woman, then he's forced to marry her. Now, the other Bible versions, if you look, up, look them up, have actually changed where it says, uh, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her to a woman which is not betrothed and rape her. Now, if, if the Bible did say that, that would be a bit weird, right? I mean, a man rapes you and now you're forced to marry him. And he just pays the father 50 shekels of silver and, you, and you, she can't be put away. Well, that's not what the Bible actually says. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 22, 28, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and lay hold on her. So lay hold on her doesn't necessarily mean that she is forced or she's raped. It's just if you sleep with somebody, obviously you have to lay hold on them. Otherwise, how are you sleeping with them? So a lot of people um, will try and take this verse to show that the Bible says that if you rape a woman, you must marry her. Um, no, that wouldn't make sense because if you rape a woman, right, 
you're meant to be put to death. You're not meant to. Um, so it would contradict the passages that came right before it. So I just wanted to point that out there. Now let's go to Matthew 118. This is another passage that is to do with this topic. Uh, so this is the story of Joseph and Mary. And the position of position one and two, which is fornication before and fornication before um, betrothal, they'll say here, this is actually an example of that law. And it's in Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together. So there's the key passage there. It says, She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. And then it goes on into the Christmas story. So they'll say here, well, you see, this is an example of Deuteronomy 24. Because Deuteronomy 24 only allows divorce in, in the case of fornication, and they'll see here, here's an example of where it happened, where Joseph was espoused to Mary. He found her with child of the Holy Ghost. So he's thinking, oh, this woman has fornicated. And being a just man, he was minded to put her away privily. So he was justified in being able to put away his wife because um, the fact that she's with child proves that she had committed fornication. And then the angel had to uh, intervene and say, no, 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 it's actually born of the Holy Ghost because that was the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you take the position that the fornication happened before, you could accept this verse, right? You could say that, well, before they were espoused, because maybe, maybe the angel approached... Oh, no, 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 that wouldn't make sense, actually. So you couldn't, you couldn't take that position because she only conceived of the Holy Ghost when she was espoused to Joseph. Right? So this would not be an example of fornication before um, while they were single. You could say this is a, an example of fornication when they were betrothed because they were espoused she, he found her with the child of the Holy Ghost and then he was able to put her away. Now, if you take the position that adultery is grounds for fornication, does this contradict that position? It doesn't. Because this is just a story of what happened between Joseph and Mary, you could, I could still accept this. Like if I take the position that adultery is grounds for divorce, I could still accept that this situation is just and right. Because people that believe that adultery is grounds for divorce still believe that fornication in the betrothal period is grounds for divorce as well. So... I can accept this position and say, yeah, I, I agree that Joseph did the right thing or could do the right thing by putting away Mary. But does that mean if they had consummated, if this example was that they had consummated and then the, the lady had committed fornication or adultery, was he not able to put her away? Well, you can't build that doctrine from this passage because this is just an example of when fornication happens in the betrothal period. You get what I'm saying? So this does not contradict the third position. It's just an example of the second position. Now let's go on. Uh, Jeremiah 3. This is when things start to get interesting. All right, Jeremiah 3. This is um, Jeremiah preaching on um, some, some words from the Lord. And we'll go through this chapter and we'll, we'll see what it says. Jeremiah 3. They say, If a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. So this is a reference to Deuteronomy 24. Remember Deuteronomy 24, it says, if you find uncleanness in her, he can put her away, send her out of his house. She can go and be another man's wife. But if that other man put her away or he dies, she can never go back to the first husband. That's abomination. Now, I don't know why that's abomination. You know, if God says it, then it is an abomination. It might... It might B, because marriage represents the spiritual relationship between God and his believers, right? And, and maybe, just maybe, Deuteronomy 24 is a picture of being a reprobate. You know, like if you, I guess, leave God in a sense and go and marry another where Israel, I guess, used to be, you know, married to God in a sense, where we read in Jeremiah. If they go and, and, and yoke themselves up to false gods and idols, that's like God saying, you're done, I'm done with you, you can never marry me again. Um... So that, that, that could be the picture of what God is trying to, to, to build into that, that, that moral law there. Um, but anyways, Jeremiah 3 is alluding back to that passage. That's why it says that. Verse 2, Lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with. So he's saying, you know, so he's using this analogy of Israel and Judah being these, these harlots, right, and going and committing fornication with, uh, with idolatry. 
He says, go lift up your eyes into the high places and see. So you say, where, where is there where you've not slept with somebody? In the ways uh, hast thou sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden and there hath been no latter rain and thou hast a, for a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Will thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide from my youth? <coughs> Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. The Lord said un also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? So this is God speaking, remember? This is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou not seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up unto every high mountain and unto every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. Uh, of the prostitute and I said after she had done all and I said after she had done all these things turn thou unto me but she returned not and her treacherous sister Judah saw it now look at this passage and I saw wherefore all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not but went and played the harlot also and it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. So Judah is doing the same thing Israel did, committing adultery, right? With stones and with stocks. And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignedly saith the Lord. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words towards the north and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. Now verse 8 is, a, is, a, is one of those verses, if you take the position of fornication is not adultery, because a lot of people will take the position that fornication is not adultery. My position is that adultery is a form of fornication. Because if you read verse 8, it says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away. So he doesn't say that Israel committed fornication. He says that Israel committed adultery. I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Now, if think about it, right? If, if you take Matthew 19 and say God never intended, God hates divorce, he never intended divorce, why is he using divorce as an analogy for something he does? So I believe in Matthew 19 when Jesus says, for the hardness of your heart, Moses gave you this precept. I don't think it's that God um, is saying that divorce is, is, is evil in the situation that he gave it because otherwise, why is he doing it? Right? Why is he putting away Israel? I think what, what Matthew 19 is teaching is that in the beginning, yes, God made the male and female and never intended divorce, but because of the hardness of man's heart to commit fornication, he allowed this precept. He gave this precept because he never intended us to commit fornication. And that's why he allowed it, um, uh, the, the bill of divorce to be put into place. Now, if you read verse 8, and you see here that adultery is a justification for divorce, you're stuck with two things that you have to accept. First of all, you can't accept that the only position is the fornication happens outside of betrothal, right? Because that would not be adultery. Right, so if your position is the fornication only happens outside betrothal and fornication and adultery are two separate things, fornication is only um, uh, sex outside of marriage or outside of betrothal, adultery is um, sex when you're betrothed or married, you have trouble with this verse. Right? Because this verse is saying that God saw, the, saw them commit adultery and then he gave them a bill of divorce. So it cannot be the, the first position because the first position only allows is not adultery. That's, that's only fornication. Now, if you take the second position, right, and you say, okay, well, God has not technically consummated the marriage yet because the marriage of the marriage supper of the Lamb has not yet happened. You could say, well, he was just betrothed to them. He, you can be considered a person's wife when you're betrothed. But what you would have to accept is that a, a, the, when you sleep with somebody within the betrothal period, that is considered adultery. Uh, that, that you have to accept that you can call that adultery. Remember when I said the two laws? 
So the reason why I think that's a, that's a bit shaky, because why are there the two laws, right? Because if you say that's called adultery, and therefore it's just God putting him away, putting Israel away in the betrothal period, then you have the two laws which distinguish the two but have the same uh, punishment. Now, on a bit of a side note here, what this verse does prove, without a shadow of a doubt, I believe, is that fornication includes adultery. Because if Jesus says, if you put away your wife, except it be for fornication, right? And then God says, says Israel commits adultery and then puts her away. Don't you see how that, that fornication, adultery is fornication. Now, fornication is not always adultery because it's like a subset. It's like, it's like adultery is a sin, but not all sin is adultery. Does that make sense? So fornication is when two people sleep together. Thanks, Ashton. <laughs> we talked about that last week. So fornication is when two people sleep together. I, I'd, I'd agree with that. Adultery is when a married or if you take the second position, a betrothed person sleeps with somebody, right? And does the, 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 that carnal act. So now we're left with those two positions because this rules out the first position that fornication is, uh, only happens outside of the vows and outside of the consummation. Now on a bit of a side note here, um, I want to show you a couple of other verses that prove because it's not that just that verse. Even though I think that verse is enough to prove that adultery is fornication, I just want to show you a couple of other verses that I believe prove that adultery is fornication. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, he's saying that you, you're fornicating with somebody's wife and it's called fornication because he's saying there's fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Now, if you have so your father's wife, that's adultery, isn't it? It's also something that is worthy of the death sentence um, and, and it's referred to here as fornication. Uh, let me show you here in Revelation 2, 21, talking about Jezebel here in, uh, what church was it? I can't remember the church. Thyatira. Look at what it says here. It says, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. So he's saying that Jezebel will repent of her fornication. And she repented not. Look at this. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So she's committing fornication with the people in the church of Thyatira and he's saying here that those people are committing adultery with her. So I think there's that parallel there in those two passages that the fornication is the adultery that is being committed uh, with the men in that church with Jezebel. The last one I want to show you, and I won't read the whole passage for the sake of time, but Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16 is a very famous passage where basically God is railing on the nation of Israel for being a harlot and a prostitute and saying, you know, you, you, you know at least a, a harlot and a prostitute gets paid, but you're, gonna go, you're going out and sleeping with all these people and you're not even taking hire, so you're worse than a prostitute. And, you know, people that sleep with people that they're not married to, you know, you ought to take this on board and see what God thinks about that. God is saying, you know, you're sleeping with this man. You, you, at least a prostitute gets paid for sleeping with the man and you're sleeping with this man and you're not even getting paid. You're, you're worse than a prostitute. Um, so God does not ver think very highly at all of people that fornicate. But I wanted to sh just jump to a couple of verses here. And I actually believe... Um, uh, this passage is talking about God marrying the nation because it says here, um, maybe, maybe I'll just read it because I'm just trying to find the verses. Uh, here we go, verse 6. He says, And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted with thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Um, I have I've caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast hast increased and waxen great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee. Behold, thy time was the time of love. So I think what that's referring to is saying, you know, she's, she's past her period, she's past the flower of her age. I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. And I believe that's referring to them sleeping together. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. So, I believe that this passage is talking about God actually, you know, spiritually becoming the wife and husband, uh, becoming the husband 
of the nation. Now let's go through. It says it goes on about how he he uh, sort of beautified and adorned um, this lady and made her beautiful. Um, but look at this, verse fifteen. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and playedst the harlot because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications on every one that passed by. His it was. So we see here that he's, he's accusing, well, he's not accusing, he's saying that the nation is committing fornication against him. Now let's skip down to verse 32. You can read this again in your own time where it just goes on and on about the evils and the wicked fornication that Israel is playing. But I just wanted to show you that verse because I wanted to show you that God is actually showing what this nation is doing is called fornication. Now let's go to verse... 32, oh, verse 30. He says, How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord, seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and has not been as the harlot, look at this, and has not been as the harlot, in that thou scornest higher. So you see how he's saying here, you're not like a prostitute, because at least a prostitute gets paid. You scorn the higher. You don't want people to pay you, but the harlot is actually in a better position because she's getting paid. But as a wife, look at this, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husbands. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest gifts to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. So you see here they're saying that they're committing fornication, and he's saying here that what you're doing is like a wife that commits adultery. See, so the fornication being linked up with adultery. Let's go down to verse 38. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved with all them that, has, that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. And look at this. And I will judge thee as women that break wedlock, and shed blood are judged, and I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. Um, he goes on to say, I strip thee naked, things like that. Now, the last passage I just wanted to show you here is verse 45. He says here, Thou art thy mother's daughter that, loveth, that loatheth her husband and her children, and thou art the sister of thy sisters which loathed her, their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite and your father an Amorite. I just want to see if I can find that last verse. <coughs> Oh, I should have wrote this down, but I forgot. I can't, I can't find it right now, but go back to Ezekiel 16. Basically, um, in verse 45, he says here that you are like, you know, you're like your mother, and the mother hated her husband and her children. There's another passage in there that says, the children that you bore unto me, you know, you sacrifice us. Because remember, the nation was so wicked that they were basically sacrificing their children in the fires of Molech. So if God is using that analogy and saying, you're committing adultery, you're married to me, you're like a woman that despises her husband, you're like a woman that breaks wedlock, you're like a woman that hates her children, and you're, you're putting your children to the fire, doesn't that mean that the marriage has been consummated? So if a marriage has been consummated, even in this passage, God is saying they're committing fornication. Right? So I believe that fornication is not just sex outside of marriage. I believe fornication is any sex, whether or any immoral sex, whether it's before marriage or even after the betrothal or even after the consummation. Um, okay, let's go to Numbers 5. Numbers 5. <laughs> Verse 12. I don't know if you guys have ever come across these passages. I'm going to start going to passages that you may not even have even realized these are in your Bible. Um, Numbers 5. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, um, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept closed, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. So basically, a woman has now gone and committed adultery, but there's no evidence of it. You know, she's not taken with the man, so there's no uncleanness. She's, she, hasn't, uh, she hasn't got pregnant, and, and nobody knows about it. It says verse, verse 14, 
and the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she be defiled or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him and he be jealous of his wife and she be not defiled then shall the man so he's saying like even if she's not defiled or if she is defiled if he even feel if he has jealous if he's jealous of her and he suspects something he's still justified in going through with this then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest and he shall bring her offering for her the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal he shall pour no oil upon it nor put frankincense thereon for it is an offering of jealousy an offering of memorial bringing iniquity to remembrance and the priest shall bring her near and set her before the lord and the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle the priest shall take and put it into the water and the priest shall set the woman before the lord and uncover the woman's head so shave her hair and put the offering of memorial in her hands which is the jealousy offering and the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse and the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman if no man have lain with thee and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse but if excuse me but if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. And he shall cause the woman to drink bitter water that causeth the curse, and the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand, and shall wave the offering before the Lord, and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take an handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterwards shall, the woman, uh, shall cause the woman to drink the water. When she had made her, and when he had hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her, become bitter, and her belly shall swell, and her thigh shall rot, and the water shall be, be a curse among her people. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. This is the law of jealousies, when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled. Or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him, and he be jealous over his wife, and shall set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. Now, if I didn't know, I didn't know uh, if you knew that this law existed in the Bible, where a, a husband, if, she, if he suspects his wife, of fornication and he doesn't know so there's no uncleanness there's no baby to prove it he just suspects and he's just this spirit of jealousy comes upon him it's actually a righteous thing there's nothing nothing unrighteous about being jealous over your wife or being jealous over your spouse uh, as, a, as a woman I believe he can take this woman to the priest and he, and he and he creates this holy water and basically charges her with an oath and makes her drink the water and if she has committed adultery or fornication it'll actually cause her belly and her thigh to rot so that she will she'll basically become barren because the other side of it we read here said if the woman be not defiled but be clean then shall she be free and shall conceive seed so the curse on this woman is that she's no longer able to bear children now just a side note here but you, you know see if a woman cannot bear children it's a it's a curse to her you see how see like it's a blessing for a woman to be able to bear children and if she's cursed she's put in the position where she cannot bear children and isn't it unfortunate these days that women seek to be somebody that does not have any children they want to be a career woman they want to make it a point where they don't want to bear children why would you want to seek that i mean this is a curse in the bible you mean you're cursed in the old testament to not be able to have children and yet this is something that women willingly seek these days um, because it's a blessing to have children i mean obviously not everyone can have children it doesn't mean you're cursed if you're trying to have children and you don't have children it's just it's something you ought to seek right it's 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 a blessing that god has put there and it's a curse if you don't if you cannot have children so there's the, the curse and the and, and being let off the curse here she's cursed if she cannot have children but if she didn't defile herself with another man then she shall be free and shall conceive seed now why is this passage interesting because 
Remember, we're just looking at the second two positions now. We're looking at the position that if the fornication happens when you're betrothed or after you've consummated the marriage. Now, if you take the position that you can only put away your wife, um, no, wait, wait, first of all, first of all is if, if, her, if, if, if she's committed adultery, right? Did you ever think if she's committed adultery and they, she takes the bit, the bit of water and she gets the curse, right? Her belly swells, her thigh rots, she can no longer conceive seed. Did, did, you, ask, did you ever wonder, why isn't she just put to death? Right? Because like, you think, well, isn't that proven? I mean, God has just proven that she's committed adultery on her husband. Why isn't she put to death? Why is it? Because she, she's obviously not put to death, right? Because she says she shall be, uh, she goes out and she's a curse amongst her people. I mean, if she's dead, right? She's no longer a curse amongst her people. She's gone. And this is when I realized that when you commit adultery, the, the lady is not always put to death because there's not always witnesses to witness against her. And God is not a good enough witness to witness against her. And you can't just create witnesses to put her to death, right? So the fact that this has happened and she does not put to death, um, that's just an interesting point there, right? But the reason why that's interesting is because if you take the position that only fornication before after betrothal, you can put away your wife. Remember Deuteronomy 24? That means in this position, only Deuteronomy 24 can be invoked if you have not yet consummated the marriage with this woman. So that makes sense, right? I mean, you, you, you take her, she's committed fornication, you take her to the priest, she's cursed because she's committed adultery, and now she's a curse amongst her people, and you can put her away, right? And marry, and marry another woman. Now, what doesn't make sense to me is if... If you take the position that you can't divorce a woman after the marriage has been consummated, then if that's the situation in this example, why would you want to take your wife to the priest? Like, think about it. Like, if, if this is the wife you're married to and you cannot marry anyone else, you cannot put her away, why would any man want to take his wife to the priest to curse her so that she can never have children again? Because that just basically means you can never have any more children. Are you getting this? Like if I can put, like say if Elizabeth has committed adultery and we haven't consummated, I could say, well, I think you've committed adultery. Take her to the priest. She's, she's, she's made a curse and I, okay, I'll put her away, right? Because she's committed adultery. But if we've consummated the marriage, Elizabeth's the wife I'm married to. And we believe that we can only have one wife, right? It's not like the Muslims. You can only have one wife. So why would I want to take Elizabeth to the priest to get her cursed so she can't have any more children? Because that means I can't have any more children. Does that make sense? So to me, it like, it's almost like, wh why would anyone want to do that if they consummated the marriage? Right? Because they, they're just removing their own chance at ha having children. So that's one thing that sort of makes me swing towards position three. Um, the other thing as well is um, a couple of things with this passage. Now, I've heard, you know, there's this YouTube channel called The Young Turks, and I really hate the people that are on that channel. <laughs> the Young Turks. That guy, what's his name? Shek or what? Czech? He's so, uh, I, just, I just hate how he misrepresents Christianity and, and he's such a, like, a liberal and he just, he hates God. But anyways, he was going on once about, you know, because, you know, the whole thing about Planned Parenthood and saying, oh, you know, he was saying, oh, you're using it for life-saving research and everything like that. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, that's not the point, Check. The point is that they're killing the babies in the first place. You know, it's not what they do with the babies afterwards. Anyways, he made the point, I was listening to one thing he was saying he was having this rant about abortion and he's saying like, oh, if Christians would just read their Bible, they would see that the Bible is for abortion because there's a law that when you take the lady, you know, she's committed adultery and she's, she's pregnant with the baby, that you take her to the priest and he makes this, this water and it causes her to have an abortion. And that's how they interpret that verse. Now, is that what's happening in this verse, right? Because it's not. See, it's not causing her, see, when her belly swells and her thigh rots, it's not causing her to have an abortion because what did it say up further up? Let's go back up there. Oh, this passage is longer than I thought. Uh, where is it? It says here in verse 13, And she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. Right? Because if the woman has an uncleanness now, or she's pregnant, you don't have to go to the priest to prove that she's committed adultery because she's committed adultery. Right? I mean, it could be, right? You could say that it, it could be that it was yours, right? But I, I suppose you wouldn't take, if you, if you suspected that it was yours, you wouldn't have the spirit of jealousy come upon you, right? So you're obviously suspecting that it's not yours, but there's evidence now that she's committed adultery. But anyways, my point is, 
it's saying here if she's not taken with the manna, because if she committed adultery and she has a baby, obviously you wouldn't, they wouldn't take her to the priest and kill the baby because then that would be an abortion. So it's just saying that her belly will swell, her thigh will rot because she's no longer able to have a baby, right? And that's the curse that's put on her. And that's why the opposite of it is that she shall be free and shall conceive seed. So I don't believe this is an abortion. And I think obviously to be consistent, I would interpret it that way. Otherwise, you know, if, if you interpret it the other way, it would be inconsistent with preserving life and, and, and loving your children, you know, and all, and all those other things. <coughs> Now, why, why has God got this law? Because you might think this is a, kind of a weird law. I kind of think it would be nice if we still had it today, right? And you could, you could, even if there was no evidence, it was a way to like sort of find out if somebody committed adultery, a, a miraculous way. I think, this, I think this passage exists because this is how we, we get an idea of how much God uh, uh, exalts marriage. You know, like he exalts marriage, he exalts purity, and he exalts the fact that a, a husband and wife should not have this spirit of jealousy between them. So he has this law here so that, that can be, there's, there's, a, there's a way to resolve that. Um, so I think that's one reason why God might have that law, but you know, you might speculate other reasons. Now, why then do I believe this passage supports um, putting away a woman after uh, they've consummated the marriage. One is, I already mentioned to you, is that if this is the only woman you're meant to be married to, why would you want to curse that woman? Because now you can't have any children. The second reason is, it's, it's an interesting phrase here at the end of the passage in verse 31, where it says, um, so the, the priest executes all this law upon her, and it says, then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity, and this woman shall bear her iniquity. So if she has committed adultery, it's saying here that the man will be guiltless, right, if this happens. Um, and the woman shall bear her iniquity. Now, I sort of thought to myself, why would the man be guiltless if he's done nothing wrong? He didn't, he didn't commit the adultery. He has a right to be jealous. If they're only betrothed and she's committed adultery, he can justly put her away. I mean, what wrong is he doing? See, I personally think it's saying there that the man is guiltless because you can't, you normally you can't put her away, right? Normally you can't put your wife away just on a suspicion. But if you take her to the priest and the adultery is proven, now he can put her away and he's guiltless. That's what I, that's what I believe that's, that's saying. Um, let's go on to a, another... Pa oh, wait. Okay, the other, last thing I wanted to show you here. Um... And we'll go back to Deuteronomy 24. Okay. Before we go back to Deuteronomy 24, just look at verse 13. It says here, um, so it says, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and look at this, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and he be kept and be kept closed, and she be defiled. I just want you to note that passage here, because this is obvious that a, a woman has slept with a man, and that's why the Bible says you're defiled, right? You're defiled because of the fact you've slept with somebody. You're not just defiled because if you if you marry if you betroth somebody, you're not defiled yet, right? Because you've just made the vow. You're defiled once you sleep together. Now, with that in mind, let's just go back to Deuteronomy 24. With that in mind, I want you to read this passage and tell me whether you think this passage is talking about fornication during the betrothal or the original couple have actually already consummated the marriage. When a man had taken a wife and married her, now that's the first point I would say that they've consummated because I believe the Bible defines marriage as opposed to espousal or betrothal as when you've actually come together. You've taken a wife and you've married her. Um, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. And look at this. 
after that she is defiled. After that she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, look at this. It says here, um, in verse 3, it says, If the latter husband die which took her to be his wife. So it uses the same words in verse 1 where it says, If a man take a wife and marries her. But see, the second husband, right? The second husband has taken this wife and he's defiled her. So why does the law then give an allowance for the second wife to hate her and put her away? Or if he dies, if he can only put her away after the betrothal but before consummation? Right, because obviously this woman has committed adultery with the second husband. The second husband has put her away, but it says after that she is defiled because she's been defiled by the second husband. Does that make sense? So he's saying, you've, you've been with this wife the first time, you've married her. She's then gone to a second husband, right? And he's either put her away or he's die, died. And it's saying that she can't go back to the first husband after that she's defiled. Why? Because the second husband has already slept with her. Right? But if the second husband has already slept with her and he's able to put her away, or if he dies, she's able to, she's, she can't go back, wouldn't that support the fact that, the, the, that verse 1, when it says he's married her and put her away, that that's the same scenario? You know, that he's defiled her and then he's put her away, and then the second one, he's also defiled her and then put her away? Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm losing you guys there, but... I just think that it's hard to take this passage and still believe, obviously we, we've already sort of done and dusted fornication outside of betrothal. I just think it's hard to interpret this passage and not accept that the man in the verse 1 has consummated the marriage. Because he's married her and also the second husband has defiled her and it uses the same passage there. And if you line it up, remember in Numbers 5, where it says he's lied with that woman carnally and defiled her, so I believe that the second husband has defiled her, right? He's put her away and he can't go back. And if the second husband defiled her by taking her to wife, wouldn't that make sense that the first husband also slept with her when he took her to wife? Just a thought there. All right, let's go to another verse. I hope this is interesting for you. And I hope you see like how I'm testing this position. Like I'm, I, I've got this position, I'm going on all these different verses and I'm thinking, how, can, can this verse be understood in light of the position that I have, which is adultery um, is a justification for divorce. And I, I hope I've given you an explanation of all these, these verses. Um, John 4, this is the story of the woman at the well. And you're probably thinking, what does the woman at the well have to do with, with adultery and divorce? Remember, she was... Divorced five times. So let's look at, look at what she says and what Jesus says about her and see if we can line up the different positions with these passages. John 4, 16. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had. And I just want you to note that word there. Thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. Now, it's interesting to note here that the woman at the well, Jesus doesn't say, thou hast five husbands. He says, thou hast had five husbands, which means that she must have been married and divorced lawfully in order for Jesus to have said, you had five husbands. Because if she got married and divorced them unlawfully, they would technically still be her husbands, right? Because... You know, that's why you commit adultery when you put away your wife, except for the cause of fornication. You commit adultery because you're still technically married to that person. Now, if, right, you take the position that betrothal, um, the fornication must happen after betrothal, but before consummation, this must mean that this woman committed fornication five times within that period. Do you know what I mean? But then how, uh, is that reasonable? I mean, this is not proof, but I'm just thinking, is that reasonable? Because how, how often do people get betrothed? And how long is even that period up to consummation anyway? But you would have to believe for her to be, have had five husbands, that they, she had been put away five times before the consummation. Otherwise, she would still be married to those five men. Um, but, but 
if she committed the fornication after the consummation, then that's fine, right? I mean, she has more time, obviously, to do that. And I believe that's, that's more likely what she's done because obviously she's in fornication now. She hasn't married the man. She's sleeping with the man she's not married with now. So then obviously, or possibly, she's just done that um, while she was married to her five last husbands. So that, there's a thought there. Um, all right, let's go to another passage. Deuteronomy 21. 10. <clears throat> now this is a passage about um, the beautiful captive and marrying the beautiful captive. I don't know if you guys have ever read, th this might be a passage that you've never read in your Bible before, but um, this is one that was actually brought up when I went soul winning with, um, with Raymond. When he came over from Brisbane, we went soul winning and we talked to a Muslim and he actually brought out this verse to try and give an accusation against the Bible. So I want to read this for you, give you a bit of an explanation and also explain how it fits in with the topic of the sermon. It says here, When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and thou seest amongst the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldst have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in thy house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband and, shall be thy, and she shall be thy wife. So just note that. So he's saying, you know, you do all these things with this captive woman and then after this month you go in unto her. So there's that consummation. And now she's, she's your wife, you're her husband. And it shall be if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. Um, I might just read this as well. If a man have two wives, one beloved and one hated, because um, since I'm here, I just want to touch on this one. If a man have two wives, one beloved and one hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the sons of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn, but he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. The reason why I just wanted to touch on that verse is because you know a lot of people will go to these passages and they try and make accusations against the Bible. I think it's very important that we have answers to these, to these passages. Um, you know, there are a lot of key topics, I think, that are going on in this day and age. You know, one is, you know, why should we believe the King James Bible? Um, you know, has the Bible been preserved? Things like that. And, and I think one of these, these social issues, I think, are a, an important question on how we can be consistent and believe what the Old Testament says. Because even though some people may not believe the Old Testament laws apply to us today, today there was a time when they did apply. Right? So even if you say, oh, you know, God doesn't operate like that, there was a time where he did operate like that. So you still have to figure out why this law can be moral and why it can be a right thing to do. So with this second passage, and I, I'm going on a total rabbit trail here, but I just thought it'd be interesting for you guys. But, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, the Bible says that you can only have one wife, right? And the Muslims will say, you know, well, you can have four. And they'll say, but no, the Bible says if a man has two wives. But if you can only have one wife, why is there a law telling you about having two wives, right? Because you could make the case and say that, you know, there are people in the Bible that had two wives and they were just doing the wrong thing um, and say, well, no, but the right thing to do was just to have one wife. So David had multiple wives, Abraham had multiple wives and all these other people had multiple wives. They were just sinning. But you say, well, but why is there a law that says if a man has two wives, doesn't that kind of assume that people would have multiple wives? Well, no, not necessarily, because, you know, we have laws that deal with fornication, but God doesn't want us to fornicate, right? We have deal, laws that deal with these things. It doesn't mean God allows those things or want those things to happen. So just because a law deals with a multiplicity of wives doesn't mean that God actually wants that situation to take place. And when you actually read what this law is about, it's not about, it's not like the Muslims that say if a man has four wives, just make sure you treat them equally and don't, don't favor one over the other, then you can have four. Basically giving justification for why you should have four uh, or why you can have four. What this is saying is if a man has two wives, if you read the rest of the passage, it says if you have two wives and they're both born sons, it's talking about how to deal with the inheritance. 
because remember the firstborn got a double portion of inheritance so it's talking it's saying here a man has two wives and he has sons of those wives which son should get the double portion it should be the first wife even though you've hated her and put her away it doesn't mean you give the firstborn right to your second wife who has a son so you see it's not justifying a multiplicity of wives it's actually talking about how to deal with the inheritance of the firstborn now what about the captive uh, woman now there's a couple of things here you know when you read this passage see what the Muslim was saying to me was you know you've just gone in and you have slaughtered this girl's family right because you know that's the judgment of God upon a city they go in and they, they take this they, they, they destroy this city and there are, so, there are some instances when they would not kill the children and woman, women I guess that just comes up to the directive of God and, and God allows the men of Israel to take these woman, women as their wives now when you hear that phrase the picture you probably get in your head is you know these barbar these barbarous men going in and they're like just raping these women and take you know the women are like no 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 we don't want to be your husband we don't want to be your husband just taken and 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 forced to be married to these men isn't that the picture that you get when you think about this you know there's this beautiful woman amongst the captives and it's just a man's decision and he just says you know what i'm t you know you don't have a choice i'm gonna marry you and and you know too bad so sad right i don't know if that's the image that we really should have because that's the image that we like we think of slavery right right we think of the cotton pickers and we think of them being oppressed and ill-treated but that's not slavery in the bible slavery in the bible is when you take on somebody because they cannot fend for themselves anymore they're, they're a slave but then you you employ them right you treat them well you give them a place to stay you feed them there are certain ways you had to treat a servant you couldn't beat them if you if you beat them to the point where they were injured you know you would have to make recompense for that so you you're not just free to treat them however you want so when we have a law like this where somebody is able to marry a captive woman we got to keep you can't just negate all the other laws right just like there's a law here where you can marry a captive woman but does that mean you just negate love your neighbor as yourself love the Lord with all your heart how you're meant to treat people so it's not that he can just treat this woman however she he wants I mean if he's got to take on this wife right he has to treat her like God expects you to treat a wife right so it's not like he just takes this captive but you know you treat a free woman this way where you treat a captive like a slave and a servant and different also we can't just throw out the fact that you can only get married to one person right so just because he's able to see this beautiful woman and take him to be his wife does that mean that he's allowed to have multiple wives no so this law must only apply to people that are not married yet right? otherwise you can't take a second wife because you'd be in sin um, also it doesn't say whether or not the woman had a choice in the matter it just says if you have you see this beautiful woman and you have a desire under her you can take her to be your wife but does that mean that the woman also doesn't want to be married to this man because this this woman even though she yeah okay the, the, they're in a time of war and this thing has happened but maybe she also wants to get married to this man and that's why it's allowed it to happen and this is why I believe you know I don't know about the shaving head maybe it's the cleanless or things like that because she's come from a pagan nation but you know you know he cleans her up um, he waits one month maybe the one month period is there just to make sure that they're fine with that decision you know it's not that the, you know God is just you know the bewailing her father and father is just because she has to get over the, the grief and things like that I think it might be that you know you, you you want to marry this captive woman she might want to marry you but God is saying like don't rush into this right because she has come from a pagan nation you have just destroyed maybe her her mother and father who were in there that were or her her father uh, who was a, a, a was a wicked man and maybe he's just saying hey give it this month where she just lives with you where you don't go in under her just to make sure that this is something you want to do and then after the month if you still want to get married you can go in under her and then uh, we get to this point now what does this have to do with the sermon what this has to do with the sermon is in this scenario it says here that if it come to pass that he find that he finds no delight in her what was it saying and it shall be if thou have no delight in her then thou shalt let her go with her she will now a couple of things here is number one you know people might say well if it's wrong to put somebody away after consummation why is this man able to put this captive woman that he's married away right 
Well, one thing is, you know, I think if we line this up with Deuteronomy 24, we find in Deuteronomy 24 that if a man, uh, he's married a woman and it comes to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he had found some uncleanness in her. I think if we are to be consistent with this passage, then we must assume that this woman has also done the same thing. And that's why it uses a similar phrasing where it says, and it shall be if thou have no delight in her. I believe it's lining it up with Deuteronomy 24 where it's come to pass that he finds no, she finds no favor in his eyes because he had found some uncleanness. And it might be justified because, you know, if she's come from a pagan nation where they're committing fornication and these do, they're doing these things, that he's married this woman, he's given her a month to see if this is something that they really want to do. They then marry, he goes in unto her, and then maybe she goes and commits fornication. And then he's able to put her away. So what this, I think, has to do with the sermon is these, um, this, in this scenario, I believe he has consummated the marriage, right? Maybe she's committed fornication, maybe she hasn't, right? But in this instance, I believe she has in order to justify this. He's put her away, right? He sent her out of his house. Now, would he be lawfully allowed to do that if he hadn't consummated, if, if he had consummated the marriage? No, if you take position two, right? Because if you take position two, how is he allowed to do that? Because he would be seeing, how can God say, you can do this with a captive woman? If he's saying, one, if, if the position is once you've consummated, you can't do that. Does that make sense? But if he's consummated the marriage, and God is saying, it's okay for you to put away this woman, therefore I take Deuteronomy 24 to include um, adultery after consummation, not just adultery after betrothal. All right, last, or second last passage we'll go to, to give you an idea how far we are along. Now, I don't know if you've ever read Ezra 10, and um, if you had position two, which I used to have, I used to have position two that it was like, okay, maybe it was the betrothal. Um, but I just think all these passages, it's just hard to take that position. If you've ever read Ezra 10, it's really hard, I think, to maintain position two. Um, and we'll just read through it really quickly. But it says here, now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now is there hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away to put away all the wives and such as are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We, will, we also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests and the Levites and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word and they swear. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity, that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem, and that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all the substances should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Um, verse 10, And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so, we, so must we do. I won't read the rest just for sake of time, but... Basically what happens, this is the second rebuilding of the temple. They're back in Jerusalem, right? And Ezra, I mean, Ezra is a scribe. So he knows, he knows what Deuteronomy 24 says, right? Like he, it's not that he's in, ig ignorant. And he's commanding the people that have taken strange wives to put them away. Now, if it was wrong to put away a wife that you've consummated the marriage with, how can he command this? And remember, they have consummated this marriage because remember, he's putting, he's telling them to put away the wife 
and also to put away the children that were born of those wives. And if we scroll down all the way to the bottom, it just gives a list of all the people that had done this. So you can see how wicked the nation had become um, in taking these strange wives. It says, all these, verse 44, had taken strange wives and some of them had wives by whom they had children. So they're putting away not only the wives that they're betrothed to, they're putting away the wives that they had slept with, they had children with them, but I believe because there's these strange wives of these pagan nations that they're probably committing fornication as well, right? And this is why he's able to say, hey, let's get right with God, let's put away these wives that are committing fornication, these strange wives, and do the right thing, and, people, and all the people are saying, let's do it. And then it gives a list. This is, like, this is like a mass bill of divorcement, right? So if you're saying that it's wrong to put your wife away after consummation, this is where en masse the leaders of Israel are told to put away their wives that they've had children with, that they've consummated with. Now, like, like, see, so these passages that I'm going to, like, how, how do you still take the position? You know, and I want, you know, look, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not for divorce, right? I want as much as anybody for people to stay together. And I'm just going to go into this in a second. But, you know, I want people to get, to stay married. I don't want people to get divorced. But how do you take the position that only the fornication can happen before consummation when you've got passages like this you've got passages where you can put away the captive woman you've, you've got it saying married you've got like you know numbers five where you know why would you curse your own wife you've got this mass divorce happening in ezra 10 and it's sanctified by god because this is what they have to do in order to get right with god as a nation how do you still take that position i think it's a bit hard to take that position um, after seeing all those verses. So, you know, go back and do a bit of study yourself. Go back to the verses. I'll put all these notes up on the blog. Go back to the verses and, and just see whether you can consistently hold the other two positions and explain these verses. You know, if I take the position that adultery after consummation is justifications for divorce, I have no problems explaining these verses. You know, I can just say, well, you know, they committed fornication, that's why they can put them away. But if you say you can't put them away, you're going to put them away after betrothal but before consummation, then you're going to think, is, is everyone in that situation? You know, you'd have to accept that everyone is in that situation for God to justly command this. So let's just finish on 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'll just show you 1 Corinthians 6, 16 first. And then I'll finish on 1 Corinthians 7. And that's the last passage I'm going to. But 1 Corinthians 6 says, What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Um, just keep that principle in mind, that when you sleep with somebody, you become one flesh with that person. Um, so some clothing, closing thoughts. <clears throat> just to put this sermon in perspective. You know, in a perfect world, we shouldn't even have to address this topic, right? Because in a perfect world, people wouldn't get divorced. Right? In a perfect world, people wouldn't, or wouldn't need to get divorced because in a perfect world, there wouldn't be fornication. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 19 and all those other passages where he says, Moses gave you this precept because of the hardness of your hearts. So it wasn't giving you this precept to just allow you to put away your wife for any cause. Remember, because they asked him, can a man put away his wife for any cause, just for any reason? And he says, no, no, no. He made them at the beginning male and female. He says, well, why then did Moses give us this writing of divorce? Basically, like other people would say, they will say, why is there a law saying if a man have two wives, if you can't have two wives? So Jesus is explaining, this is how I would interpret it, just to be consistent. He's saying it's because of the hardness of your heart that you're committing fornication that I allow this precept. Why? Because when you sleep with somebody, you join as one flesh. And I think when you commit adultery, when you're married, you have certain obligations to your spouse. And this is why God allows divorce in that aspect, because if you're going to go and commit adultery and defile yourself with somebody else, why should your spouse, who is one flesh with you and has obligations to you as a wife or a husband, be obligated to join themselves under that person? And that's why I think with that frame of mind, this is why God allows it, because he says, you've now gone and defiled yourself with somebody else. This person has an obligation to sleep with you. Why should they still be obligated to sleep with you when you have joined yourself to a harlot? Um, so in a perfect world, we shouldn't even need to address this topic. But like Jesus said, the hardness of your heart God gave us this precept. The second thought I have is, you know, when, if you were to divorce illegitimately, 
If you do not divorce except for the cause of fornication, you are committing adultery and that is worthy of the death sentence. So people that divorce in the legal system today and they just say irreconcilable differences or we just don't get along or any other reasons, you know, presumed unfaithfulness that is not unproven or, you know, maybe a guy watches pornography but he has not actually committed fornication. That's not grounds for divorce because you actually have to be defiled in order for the divorce to happen and if you divorce for any other grounds it's actually adultery and that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 19 so you can only there's only one lawful way to divorce and that's fornication um, and I said this already you know I'm not for divorce at all Do you know what I mean I'm for people staying together I'm for you not committing fornication Do you know what I mean and, and not having to even deal with this topic but unfortunately we live in a world where people have committed adultery they have done these things and it's even more pertinent in today's day and age because people are not put to death even when it's proven. You know, you see somebody divorce somebody, they are now married to somebody else. According to the Bible, they should be put to death because there's witnesses and then that will nullify the wedding vow, right? But now we're in a situation uh, where people have been married, they've separated, the person has then married somebody else, committed adultery, the law does not put them to death but now that person if you take position two, cannot get married to somebody else. Um, so I'm not for divorce. I just believe the exception extends to adultery post-consummation. Let's look in 1 Corinthians 7 here. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. But I speak this by permission, and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after his manner, and another after that. Now, if you're struggling with accepting, and I did as well, I was struggling like, you know, well, if, you know, because I was always like, you know, there's no justification for divorce. But if adultery is justification for divorce, you, you want to kind of reason within yourself, well, why does God allow it in this instance? And, and this is the reason I believe God allows it, because as, at, when you're married, you have an obligation from God to sleep with your spouse. You know what I mean? So this, this attitude of you know, um, uh, you know, holding, withholding it from your husband or even withholding it from your wife is actually a sin because the Bible says here that in, in terms of the bedroom, you actually don't own your body. That belongs to your husband. And he doesn't own his body. That belongs to you. Now, I know it usually happens one way more than the other in the society that we live in but, or in just, in just in general. I understand that. So I know where we, women go get up in arms. But it's meant to be an equal... Uh, thing here where you belong to one another and even to the point where the only reason why you really should be abstaining from sleeping together is because of prayer and fasting. Now if that's the case and you're going to go commit fornication, I already sort of touched on this, you're joining yourself to another person. I believe the reason why God allows the bill of divorcement is because he does not, I, I believe he's not um, supporting the fact that you are now obligated to join yourself to somebody else, right? So if I go out and commit adultery, God forbid, Elizabeth is no long, should no longer be obligated to sleep with me because I've slept with somebody else, right? Now, it doesn't mean that you must get a divorce, right? Because you, you could forgive, right? And you could just forbear with it and just, you know, put it in the past and remain married, maybe for the sake of children. So I'm not saying that just because somebody has committed adultery that you must get divorced. I'm just saying that if a person wanted to, they could justly, I believe, put away the person because they're not obligated to join themselves unto the person that they've slept with. And I think it both works both ways. I know the Bible talks a lot about a man putting away his wife, but I do believe it works the other way around because I'm not going to turn there now, but one of the passages where Jesus talks about putting away your wife and marrying another, he actually rephrases it and says, if a woman puts away her husband, she commits adultery. So I think it, it, it does actually allow the other way around where if your husband commits adultery, you can lawfully and rightly um, put him away and marry somebody else um, in that instance. 
Now I think now, now this is the bombshell. I think that was for me. And and um, what what are the implications of this? Now a lot of people um, do believe that adultery is a justification for divorce. A lot of people, a lot of Christians already do believe this. The reason I think this may be a controversial a controversial sermon in our circle is because in our circle a lot of people do not believe adultery is justification for divorce. They believe that even if a person has committed adultery, you cannot divorce that person. Now, if that's the wrong position, you're putting people in a bad predicament because number one is remember you have an obligation to stay with to sleep with that person. And if they married somebody else, now you're joining yourself with that other person and I don't think that's right. But the other thing is, let's just continue to read in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul goes on to say, I, says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So this verse is saying here that if two people divorce, uh, if two people separate, he's saying obviously the best thing to do is to get reconciled. And if you separate, you should not marry somebody else, right? So you shouldn't marry somebody else, you should be reconciled. I think in the context of what we've talked about, talked about if they do, then you can go and marry somebody else. But this is saying here, that to the married, if you depart from one another, remain unmarried. That's the right thing to do. The right, wrong thing to do is then to go and marry somebody else. Or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Now this is not mentioning whether or not there's fornication happening or not. This is just two people, they separate for whatever reason. It's wrong for them to get remarried because that would be adultery. They ought to reconcile. But look at this. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. So it's saying if you're married to an unbeliever, you shouldn't be seeking a divorce. You should still be seeking to stay together and to be married. Um, verse 15. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in, in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So in light of what we've talked about, what are the scenarios? So the scenarios could be two believers, if they, if they separate, they ought to reconcile. right? Even with a believer and an unbeliever, if they separate, they ought to reconcile as well. That's the most thing. But God is just saying, but if an unbeliever doesn't want to stay with a believer, the believer is not obligated to try and stay with the unbeliever. He can just, they can just separate if they wish. That's what he's saying there. Because it says God hath called us to peace. Maybe one day when that brother gets saved or that sister gets saved, then the right thing would be to, to reconcile. But he's saying if the, we don't expect an unbeliever to, to try and obey the commandment of God. So it's saying if there's strife because of the faith, just separate. It doesn't then say that it's okay for that unbeliever to go marry somebody else, does it? Because it would still be adultery, it'd still be fornication if that unbeliever separated because he didn't want to be with a believing wife. It would still be adultery if he went and married somebody else. Now with that, so where what we've talked about comes into play is the situation where you either have believers or unbelievers and they've separated unlawfully, right? And one of them has now gone and married somebody else right? And the law does not put them to death. So this is where I think it has a profound impact on people's lives because a lot of people are in that situation where either they're in a divorce or an unlawful divorce, their spouse has remarried and now they've gotten saved and they now know the truth. And if somebody tells them, well, you cannot put away your husband, you cannot get married, now they're stuck in a scenario where they want to get married, but they can't because they can't even reconcile with the husband because the husband has went and married somebody else because remember it's abomination if you go back to the first spouse. So they, even if that marriage fails, they can't go back to that husband. But the fact that he is outright committing adultery, nobody can put him to death to nullify that marriage. So they're in a situation, and I know people like this, where they are praying for God to kill that person so that that, that marriage vow can be nullified so that they can marry somebody else. 
And this is where I think it has a big impact because I know people like this personally that were in that situation. And what I'm not saying at all that I've come up with this situation to give them a solution. I believe that this is the scenario because of all the verses that I've showed you and I don't think you can consistently hold the other position. You can definitely not hold the position that the fornication happens outside of betrothal, right? Because God committed, said, you know, they committed adultery and then put them away. So that, that, that position is totally off the table. The only other position might be that it's the, the fornication happens after betrothal but before consummation. And I just don't think when we look at all those passages that that's a reasonable position to take. Um, but I do think, I do feel for the people that are in that situation where they have a failed marriage and the person has gone and married somebody else and, and it's almost like now they're in that bondage of because they believed this doctrine that they cannot get remarried, that they now just have to live out their life in singleness hoping that one day that person dies so that they can get remarried and have children. Um, so that's why I think this is quite a profound sermon because I think a lot of people are in that situation and I think a sermon like this would make a big difference if they knew what the Bible actually taught about it. Anyway, I'm sorry that sermon was a bit heavy. Well, actually, I'm not sorry. Um, that sermon was a bit heavy, I know. It's getting a bit warm in here. I did warn you that it was, a bit, it was going to be a long one, but let's pray and then we'll get ready for lunch and we can talk about it a bit after.